This week on The Gadget Show Web TV, Otis and I test the theory of glowing eggs. And John's got a first look at the Koan S9. Plus the latest in gadget tech news. Hello and welcome to The Gadget Show Web TV. Later, Otis tries to make eggs glow using a laser pen. But first, here's John with a first look at the Koan S9. This is Cowon's new rival to the iPod Touch, their S9. You can see where they've uh, got the inspiration from. The styling is definitely dominated by the touch screen. In this case, it's slightly smaller, 3.3 as opposed to 3.5 inches, and it uses a different technology. It's an AMOLED screen, standing for Active Matrix Organic Light Emitting Diode. Like the touch, the styling is refreshingly free of buttons and clutter. In the case of the Cowon, the buttons are mainly at the top and the bottom. You've got a volume control here, track forward, track back on that side, and a raised button in the centre here that allows you to switch between play and pause. Down at the bottom, there's a 3.5mm headphone socket in the middle, a USB connection on this side, irritatingly a proprietary one, and on this side, the on-off button and lock switch. It's much lighter than the Touch at 77 grams, but they've still given it a quality feel with this rubberized finish to the back and a distinctive curve to the styling. In terms of sizes, it's only available as an 18 or 16 gigabyte model. There isn't a 32 gigabyte option, unfortunately. What really sets the Cowan apart, though, is its sound quality. I've been very impressed by the sound quality of Cowans before, and this is no exception. Plug in a decent pair of headphones, and this really is a music player you can listen to and really enjoy the music. It's not just something for convenience you can actually get a really good soundscape and it gives you a really involving, very detailed sound. It also supports a wide range of audio files, including lossless FLAC files and OGG files for open source enthusiasts. My impressions of the actual touch aspects of the screen are rather mixed. Like the iPod, it uses the same capacitance-based technology, but it doesn't seem anything like as responsive. And you can find yourself stabbing at buttons in vain while nothing happens. It's also got a few quirks to the interface when you're playing a track. There's no obvious back button to get back to your tracks listing. You go through a button at the top left, and then you can go through a back button to other parts of the menu. You'll get used to that, though, I'm sure. Where the screen really comes into its own, though, is when you're playing video. I've never seen video so good on a device this size. Those OLEDs really do do their stuff and deliver fantastic colours, great contrast, Lots of excellent smooth movement and uh, plenty of pixels as well. 480 by 272 gives you quite a good definition. It also supports a wide range of uh, video formats. DivX is supported directly, although disappointingly it doesn't do the popular H.264 codec. You do often have to get the pixels absolutely right, though, to get your videos to display. There is basic conversion software provided. It does a reasonable job, though I found it uh, struggles getting the aspect ratio right on this uh, DVD I converted of the gadget show. It's also important, I found, to get the latest firmware initially. I tried the player with an early version of the firmware and I couldn't get videos to play at all, but once I updated it, things went a lot better. In terms of other features, you do get a rather pleasant radio interface and a reasonable quality on the radio as well, and support for Bluetooth headphones and a voice memo recorder. You don't, though, get uh, a removable storage, there's no card slot, you don't get a removable battery either, although the battery life is really rather good. They promise 55 hours of audio, 11 hours of video. I've been using it for ages, the batteries haven't run out, so I can't see any reason uh, to doubt that. I can't recommend the S9 unequivocally above the iPod Touch. The Touch has the Wi-Fi, web browsing, the App Store, the sheer ease of use, none of which the Cowon can match. But if what you're after is the best audio and video quality, the Cowon S9 is the one to go for. Right, now it's time for the news, and Amazon have announced they're going to release a second Amazon Kindle, and they're calling it the Kindle 2. Now, I've got the original version here, so you can see the differences of the new design. They've merged the keyboard for ease of use, 
the display has curved edges and they've minimized the buttons on the side. And obviously, as you can see, the logo has moved to the top. Now you can't see from this picture, but the Kindle 2 is very thin. It's exactly 0.9 centimeters all the way around. As you can see, it differs on the original Kindle and it weighs just over 10 ounces. Now it's not just the aesthetics Amazon have worked on on the new design. They've given it more storage. It's got two gigabytes worth of internal memory. It's got a sharper display and can show 16 different shades of gray, which is really good for graphics and pictures. And they've increased the battery life by 25%. So you can read more books before you have to worry about recharging. Now it's going to be available in the US from the 24th of February for $359, but there's no word yet on when the Kindle 2 will arrive in the UK or how much it will cost if and when it gets here. Next, Marvel are going to sell motion comics on iTunes. It was announced at this year's New York Comic Con that Marvel is working with comic artists Neil Adams and Continuity Studios to create a new form of digital comics called In Motion. The In Motion comics will include animated scenes and spoken dialogue to add a new dimension to storytelling. The InMotion comics will also be available in print format after their initial release online, but there's no word yet on how much either of these will cost. But comic lovers can enjoy a new Spider-Woman motion comic by Brian Michael Bendis and Alex Maleev at some point in February. Right, now it's time for a bit of science with Otis, and this week he's been looking for glowing eggs with the aid of a laser pen. You've brought me into the kitchen. I'm slightly concerned. You want me to make you a sandwich, a cup of tea? Don't worry, I'm not asking you to make me anything. And in return, I'm not going to prepare any food for you. <laughs> I don't want any accidents happening just yet. I found another amazing experiment on the web that suggests you can make eggs glow in the dark using a laser pen. But is it true? Personally, I don't think so. But we're going to find out. The science goes something like this. Eggs have omega-3 in them. Some eggs have a slightly higher concentration of omega-3 and this gives off a low frequency level of radiation. Now you can perform what scientists call coaxing on these eggs by introducing another waveform, say from a laser pen, yeah. the two add together to create a visible waveform, the glow. Ah. You see? Yeah. Now this phenomenon occurs in one in every 11 eggs. I'm going to shine my laser pen across all the eggs and one of them should start to glow. Gotcha. Ready? Yes. Okay, here we go. Shine, shine. So I'll turn the light off, make it a bit easier. Good idea. There we are. Give them a final. I say we inspect these eggs and find which are glowing. <laughs> Let's go. Well, well, this one felt kind of heavy. Okay. Yeah, and it might be a really a thick bit shell. More. Yeah. So uh, let's crack it open and see that the glow is missing. Um, there's no glow there. Um, yeah, put the light back on. <clears throat> I would say then, uh, conclusively from my little experiment, not the demonstration I was hoping for, that eggs that glow in the dark do not exist. Well, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for this week, but we'll be back at the same time and the same place next week, so we'll see you then.